Gosh, isn't it bright here? It is. So um, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to uh, facilitate this panel. It's on um, uh, Git and version control in the enterprise. Um, I'm going to ask uh, my panel to introduce themselves uh, and maybe also uh, tell me a bit about um, how they were first introduced to Git and uh, what their reaction was. Um, I'll, I'll go first. So I'm, I'm CB. I've already been introduced. Um, and my, my first introduction was when um, a colleague over a decade ago said, um, have you heard about this new version control system that um, Linus Torvalds is, is, is writing? I said, uh, no, no, I haven't actually. Uh, well, what is it? He said, well, it's, it's kind of distributed. So like everybody has like their own uh, copy of the repository and like anybody can kind of like uh, make a new version. And I said, well, hold on a moment. That doesn't make any sense. The whole point of a version control system is so that everybody knows what the single point of truth is and, and on what the latest version is. Uh, needless to say, since then, I've kind of learned a lot and uh, changed my mind a lot. Um, so uh, let me start uh, um, with you, um, Eric, and uh, introduce yourself. And yeah, for sure. Uh, first, CB, thanks for, uh, for moderating this uh, and, and you know, having the, the, the three companies on stage. I, I'm not aware that it's happened before, at least not in, a, in, in sort of a long form setting with an actual discussion. Uh, long overdue, I think. Uh, so that's awesome. Uh, I'm Eric van Zeist. I'm with Atlassian. I work on Bitbucket uh, Engineer. And my story is kind of similar to yours. Uh, the, I had a friend um, who I think about 2006, maybe late 2006, something like that, really early on, uh, introduced me to, uh, he said, there's this thing, it's Git, it's a new version control system. Uh, we were on Subversion at the time and it, it seemed to work fine. I didn't really see the problem. We came from CVS, that is, so it was a lot better. Um, and, uh, and, and I remember I looked at it because I had to, because it was the thing and Torvalds. Uh, and I, yeah, I didn't really, didn't really get it. Uh, as I didn't really understand the fuzz in, uh, and it wasn't until like maybe two years later or so when I, uh, when I started using GitHub, uh, that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, and I was sort of forced to use it because now GitHub was the, was the thing, um, that it really clicked. And at that point it's like, oh, this makes so much sense. Right well, thanks. I'm Brianna Swift. I'm a GitHub trainer. Uh, so I spend a lot of time talking about Git and GitHub. So I love Git Merge. Y'all are my people here. Um, my first experience with Git was just typing stuff into a black box because the internet told me to. And I did not understand it for a very, very long time. Um, once I really royally screwed up, that's when I first started to like, like, oh, this is why people want version control. And yeah, obviously been using it ever since. I'm James Ramsey, I'm product manager at GitLab, um, working on the, the Git bits of GitLab, I think is the easiest way to summarize it. Um, my first experience of Git was when I was using CVS in 2008 and it ate my data um, without me realizing. And so then I started exploring other alternatives. And I think back then we were self hosting our own Git server. Um, I think back then I was still trying to wrap my head around all the distributed aspects having come from centralized sort of version control, but then GitHub also sort of it taught me how it actually works. And thankfully uh, now I get to work on it full time. Awesome. Awesome. So I, I think um, it's, Almost for instance, it's like a, a common theme of, of like, you know, what, what is this um, uh, decentralized part to it and this distributed nature? And I kind of think when you look at um, most enterprises, most enterprises are very much around um, um, centralization. You know, when um, the typical version control tool before uh, enterprises started using Git was kind of like, yes, here is our global central repository. Here is where we, uh, we keep our code. It's central, it's safe, it's secure. Everything, everybody comes to the central truth. How is it that um, Git has been so widely adopted in enterprises uh, when you'd think kind of um, just naively that it's not actually that, that, that suitable at all for that sort of environment? Um, so it's really, I mean, carrying on going in this order for a while and then, you know, yep. kind of butt in in, in any order as you, as you see fit. And then I can use my moderating hat. Yeah, uh, I guess start. Uh, I don't know, really. Like it, it is, it is a little weird that a, in some ways that a that a tool that uh, not only sort of was designed for a fairly specific task in, in open source, this this one this one repo and, and a very specific workflow, that in amongst the sea of SEM tools, you know, like there were no no other SEM tools. There were professional tools. There were good tools. Um, 
that also it had a terrible UI, let's be honest. Uh, especially it still for does. It still does. <laughs> uh, but now there's Stack Overflowing, and Google everything, but 10 years ago is different. Uh, that, that that would you know make it into sort of you know the de facto uh, SCM, not just for open source, but everywhere. And uh, so I, I'm not quite sure. Like on the one hand, there's the, the technical merits. Like it is, it's very fast to use. Uh, the branching model is uh, is is good. Like it's substantially better than Subversion and CVS before it. And so th there are technical reasons to choose it. Um, but still, I mean, there are other uh, alternatives in uh, in and slowly but surely, well, not even slowly, get sort of has taken over. So I'm not entirely sure. I think uh, again, I think I think GitHub probably had a lot to do with it. Um, in, uh, in, in, in pull requests sort of making collaboration easier for the, so the average, more average person. Mm. Yeah, I really agree. I think that, um, you know, version control, especially at a Git conference, we think so much about the really, really detailed zoomed in view. And uh, from my experience, when I'm working with, you know, developers new to Git, that's really not where their head's at. They're like some of the talks earlier, just how do I do my job? How do I get through today with Git? Um, and that's the collaboration. It, whether it's distributed or not, whether they're using it as it's distributed or not, is, um, in my view, secondary. It gives them a way to work together in a new and better way. Yeah, I think the collaboration around forking and open source communities is really big factor in. Um, I guess forking is not necessarily a Git feature, but all the, the major hosts support that model now um, is a really great way to collaborate. Um, and then the code review tools, the collaboration, I think that's where a lot of the investment is happening, um, particularly around the repositories, is we're trying to build better code review tools um, and improve the collaboration um, so that people are building applications and software that can last decades. Um, it's not just about pushing your code, it's about developing an application that you can get to customers. Um, and I think the tooling around Git makes that really easy. Mm. So, I mean, it's kind of, just to summarize, it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's almost by surprise that Git's so widely adopted, adopted kind of in the enterprise. And kind of thinking of situations I've come across, I think a lot of it's kind of been um, uh, sort of from the ground up. So you sometimes get kind of like teams going, ah, oh, you know, our existing processes are, are slowing us down. Let's just do a little Git thing. And then mm. it becomes popular enough. It becomes kind of trendy and, and, and people want to adopt it. So I wonder about um, um, uh, typical, um, Typical kind of use cases and users in the enterprise. How do how do their um, needs differ from from kind of like open source users? What's the um, um, what are the what are the kind of challenges to get? How do how do people have to use it differently? And and I guess you know are these um, um, tools that we've built on top of Git kind of um, uh, addressing that gap? I, <laughs> I made that one question, question too yeah. difficult. <laughs> I think, I think I there are significant differences in how open source projects use Git to large enterprises. Um, particularly open source projects are using a forking model where everyone's got a distributed copy of the repository and then are sharing it back with each other. Whereas most large enterprise customers have one repository or a couple of big repositories and make use of a branching model. Um, so the kinds of access controls they need are quite different. Um, developers are often empowered to merge things quite easily and quickly, whereas in an open source community, there's a pretty small ring of maintainers and only those have right access. Um, it varies by organization, of course. Like, some big enterprises are really strict and will have much stricter controls than an open source project. Um, so I think those controls that sit around the repo are really quite different for those large enterprises. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, not only like the controls and the access and the permissions, but what's, what other software is a developer allowed to mm -hmm. use? If it's open source on my personal computer, I can do any text editor, any, you know, whatever I want. Um, but then I go to work and maybe I have a laptop that is provided to me that I cannot download anything new. I can, you know, and I'm really given a set of tools and maybe the use of Git isn't necessarily different, but, um, you know, from the surface, when you're looking at it, it might look like a completely different, um, workflow. Yeah, exactly. I don't think there's that much to add, but like the gen the biggest thing I think is stricter controls or at least different kinds of controls uh, with, you know, a typical branch workflow at the, at the center of it. And so therefore you've got uh, permission, a permission model, not just as, as, a, as a gatekeeper towards 
a repository, but on individual branches or even certain operations on a branch where you can, you can rebase or which branch you can rebase on, who can do that. Um, whether or not uh, changes can go in you know, without a pull request or if they have to go through a pull request, like the, what, what kind of uh, requirements there are before a pull request can be merged. There's a lot of kind of stuff that, you know, in a typical open source project, um, uh, or at least sort of the, the, the more established ones that use mailing lists and patches still, um, that, that's quite different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very different. So um, I, I, I've really enjoyed uh, a lot of the talks that you've had um, um, earlier today. And um, especially some of the talks about kind of um, scale and how um, we have incredibly large repositories. Um, and kind of thinking about it, are these all these enterprise features, the ability to handle kind of huge repositories. Now, I've noted, sort of, technically Android is open source and therefore it's like a bit of an exception, but it is kind of driven fairly heavily by an enterprise, if you, if you like. Um, so I was kind of thinking, um, repository granularity, monorepo, is it, is it here to stay? Does it make open source sense for open source or is it, or is it the killer enterprise feature? We only have 19 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> The short for story. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know. The I think it's a really difficult one. Like mono repos are a like Johan had a really good talk on it this mm. morning. I yeah, think. it was it was fantastic. Yeah, um, and uh, and and even he sort of after looking at the research and whatever sort of you know concluded that I I, I don't know like both work I suppose, uh, and and I guess there there's evidence of that right there there is there, there are people that. That it divides a little bit, right? There's people that really believe in like, like a mono repo for you know the, those kinds of enterprises really is the way to go, and and, and you know breaking it down into uh, smaller repos really isn't. And there's people that argue the other way around. Uh, I don't know if I'm necessarily in a in the the best position to uh, be the judge of that. Um, I do not work on a mono repo. We do not have like what you would call a mono repo. Um, but it's obviously something that we we're interested in uh, because. It's not necessarily about us. It's about um, whether or not the the industry as a whole ultimately moves towards the like a, a broader acceptance of mono repos. And I think at this point, um, I can't speak for uh, for the other uh, sites, but we don't see a lot of uh, demand for for the, that kind of scale. And uh, I'm sure Google and Facebook and all that are doing it, um, and they have. You know, they fight quite an uphill battle, um, but they're winning that battle, I guess, because there, there's a lot of things that have been changed uh, in, in, in Git and, and Mercurial also that make it better now than it was before. But at this point, I think we don't really see a lot of uh, need for it, uh, or at least uh, demand for it. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we see the request for large repositories pretty frequently. Um, it is a small minority of organizations that have truly large repositories in the, the scale of Chromium or Android or even bigger. Um, and they're often migrating from systems that are not Git. So they're, they're trying to enter Git. They may have already migrated all their other projects to Git and there's one last holdout in some other version control system. Um, but a lot of the discussion around mono repos, is, is really around the ergonomics of dealing with lots of repos, not necessarily the, the scaling problem. And sometimes those two problems can be conflated. Um, Git's making a lot of progress in supporting larger and larger repos more and more effectively. Um, but yeah, I think that there's also a parallel set of tooling that is solving some of those different problems around um, managing lots of services that are maybe all hosted in the same repository, but it could, those kind of repositories can be much, much smaller than say the Linux repository even, which was the smallest example of a, a large repo shown this morning. So um, I think either works. Yes. So, um, I think mono repos today, that's like the hot topic, right? I mean, we can talk about it for hours. Um, but I think what I find really interesting is that they're a really great example of you know, whether it's mono repos or the next thing that Git can do it really well either way. Yeah. Um, but still there's this, um, this hunger, this, you know, you many, I, I feel enterprise customers just want you to tell them what to do. <laughs> just tell me which is the right way, whether it's going to be a mono repo or break it up, just tell me. And it's, um, that's not the only time that that conversation happens with Git. There's a yeah. lot of situations where like, well, you can, you can rebase like tech. Yeah, they both work, you know, it's, 
that, that does bring up a good point, right? Like, as you said, like a lot of our customers, I think ultimately are looking up uh, to the vendor to see like, yeah. I don't know, like you guys must know like uh, of anyone, like what should we be using? And I think that is a, like, I think it's a bit of a, like a requirement, I guess, mm. for, for us um, to uh, uh, not just provide a whole bunch of tools, but also uh, guide people into the work, the right sort of workflow and not just workflow, but, but also, yeah, like I said, sort of guidance or, or whatever towards whether, whether or not you should organize your repos in, in such a way or such a way, right? Like uh, bundle a lot of stuff in, into a, what do you want to call it, a mono repo or not, or, or go the opposite direction. And um, yeah, I don't really know. Like I'm sort of, I'm sort of split on this at this point. I mean, there's a space for guidance, but then there's also a space for every customer is going to have their own demands. And as much as a vendor is going to provide guidance that we think this works well, like say mono repo works well because you don't need to deal with merge requests in 20 different places. There's going to be a significant number of customers that just sort of say, no, like we've decided that we like to work in this other way and whether or not you recommend that we have done this for 10 years and we will continue to do so. So you kind of, as a vendor, we have to support both. Hmm. So uh, the, the other sort of side of the, of the, well, there are multiple sides of the mono reaper conversation, <laughs> maybe some data decahedron or something. Um, but, but one of the things that, uh, that, that uh, cropped up in, 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 in my thoughts today, what listening to talks is that, um, um, I, I have a rule of thumb, and you can uh, agree or disagree with it, that um, your, the repository granularity kind of makes sense at, um, uh, as a, a unit of release, whatever that means for your particular code base or something. So if you're releasing something, um, then, you know, a repository that's, that's that size and you're not releasing just part of a repository or again, you know, you're not kind of bundling up a whole lot of repositories always together all at the same time. That kind of makes sense as a rule of, as a rule of thumb. Mm. But there are obviously other constraints. And one of the things that um, kind of struck me was, um, uh, do we lack good tools for uh, dealings with stuff across repositories? Because one of the things that I kind of heard today that stuck out, um, um, that stuck with me was, um, uh, saying, I like a mono repo because I can kind of, um, you know, find all of our code, you know, in one place, you know, or I can find all instances of, of stuff. I know where it is. Um, do we lack um, tools um, to take a, a set of repositories which are um, not tightly coupled, but, you know, uh, well related, loosely coupled? Um, do, we, do we kind of lack good tools for that sort of scenario that would make a mono repo less attractive? We're working on this at the, the moment. <laughs> um, we have this problem with how we have our repository structured. GitLab's got a, a monolithic Rails application, which is the, the web application, and then a range of other components like Giddly and some other services. Um, and each being a separate repository, every release we ha kind of have to bundle them up. And changes often touch multiple components in the system. So we have this problem where we're trying to build a way of coordinating those merge requests so that you can signal to someone who's reviewing one component, maybe don't merge this just yet. <laughs> There's something else that needs to merge first um, and making that more automated so that some of those pains of not having a monolithic project um, yeah, can be ameliorated. Yeah, I think that, I think the answer is yes, we are lacking good tools uh, and, and you know, mm -hmm. that might be a, a good step in that direction. Um, but I think we can do better though, hmm. right? Like the, like having everything in a, in a mono repo checked out um, makes things like, if I'm gonna refactor this, you know, the, the function of a library that's shared across, you know, different parts of this, this large distributed system, um, it's pretty easy, uh, uh, relatively speaking, because I, you know, I can use, you know, code smarts and things to find uses across all these projects and maybe even do a single refactor across all these things that are technically separate libraries. Um, you can't do that if you split everything out sort of traditionally in, in small repos, but there's no reason fundamentally that we couldn't make that work though, right? If we, if we had a, and, and I mean, these tools exist, it's just that we don't really support any of that mm. uh, yet. Um, but if a, if a, if a code host, um, had enough smarts in, uh, and understood that it's not just a bunch of text files in your repository, but mm -hmm. it's code and it's Java or C sharp or whatever. And I understand this and I can compile this and, and therefore I can find traced imports in, uh, and I can see that there's a Maven file here. And that means that there's, you know, libraries that depend on that are over there, maybe even on GitHub. 
Um, I can call those things as well. And you, know, you, can, you can build a, uh, a huge, large index, uh, an actual code index. And at that point, like I think it's possible to make like that scenario a lot better, right? Where like I am going to refactor this thing, who is it going to impact? And it's not just a matter of, uh, of you know, sort of knowing that, ooh, this library is used there, so you'll probably talk to the, the maintainer of this other thing. Uh, no, like in, in principle, I should be able to like, get a really good uh, educated guess as to this is, these are all the things that, that need to change. But yeah, that doesn't exist today, or at least we don't do it. Like, there's all kinds of stuff out there, but um, yeah. Cool. I think that also sort of touches on the fact that there can be lots of tools that sort of enable all these individual capabilities and streamline specific problems, but unless they're kind of integrated into the main tool that developers come into to do their programming, to do their code reviews and merge requests, um, they often just get forgotten or not used. Like they're not as effective if you have to go to three different places to make sure I haven't forgotten about this thing. So making sure all these systems and tools integrate um, into a single place, single source of truth is really important. Mm, yeah. And I find, um, no, it's just a kind of personal side story. It's kind of like, I find that um, I, I fully trust Git grep to find all instances of a local repository I have here. Any sort of code search that's been kind of like indexed, and I know there's kind of like magic indexes behind the scene, I, you always kind of think, is it up to date? Is it working? Has it found everything? <laughs> so, so yeah, we've got to kind of uh, build, build, build the ability to trust our tools. And that yeah, kind of it depends a bit on the language, I suppose, right? Like a yeah. dynamic language, that kind of stuff is really hard. Like Java C Sharp or like a release-only type language. Those tools, I don't know, I tend to trust them pretty well but yeah it pretty much depends on uh, mm -hmm. how, how much dynamic stuff you've got going on cool so i'm um, just going to change tack a little bit and um talk about kind of like um uh users learning and training so it's kind of like uh, open source projects t um, tend to kind of use uh, tools that are kind of uh, chosen by the maintainer and the kind of kind of core developers and it's kind of um in enterprises a lot a lot of times kind of tools are mandated um do, is is Git accessible enough to the to, to the um, uh, average developer or even designer or somebody else uh, who needs to make changes? Um, can we make it easier? Should we make it easier? I could talk about this all day. <laughs> um, I think yes, Git is accessible. That does not mean it's easy. Um, I think one of my favorite things during a Git and GitHub training is uh, helping somebody who really does not think they can learn Git and also really just doesn't want to. Um, much like the design speech earlier, you're know, like going through a few things and actually doing it and seeing, okay, this is clicking. Even if I don't necessarily understand the, the big picture yet, just enough to do something that I can be successful. Um, it's, it's a horrible feeling to already be in your career established at you know, a large company and then have to learn something that at least when I learned Git, it just made me feel like such an idiot. You know, like that sucks. Nobody likes that. Um, but having trained so many people, it's also, I think, a great opportunity for them to have that light bulb moment again and hopefully be, become excited about it. That being said, I definitely think we can always be improving how we teach it and how we help people use it. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I agree. Like we, at, at the last thing we had, we, from the moment we switched to a uh, distributed version control system, uh, we, we initially went to Mercurial, uh, I guess like 10 years ago, I think the, the, the bets were out still and, and uh, Mercurial, at least we thought was easier to onboard from uh, coming from a subversion background. The, the, the commands are a bit more like it, but underneath it's very, technically it's, it's very similar to Git, so I have uh, most of the, uh, the advantages. Um, and, and we had a, we had well, sort of an onboarding uh, thing where, you know, new people, whether they're, they're fresh out of college or, you know, just experienced developers that come from another company, um, go through a, uh, you know, uh, boot camp type thingy, uh, which includes uh, uh, comprehensive, um, here's how to use Mercurial or get these things. So, yeah, I think it is, it's, uh, it's pretty important. Yeah, I think there's, there's, often, there's a lot of work that has happened over the past years to improve some of the commands of Git to make them more easy. And there's some proposals, I think, out there to um, streamline some of the common commands and in favor of some new ones. Um, so I think that's really exciting to see that the core Git project is working to make the command line tool easy to use. But I think there also is a big market of all these desktop clients um, 
I think you, you have the GitHub desktop and the Atlassian source tree and there's Tower and a whole bunch of other great vendors out there building these amazing visual tools to help people not only use Git successfully, but also expose more of like the underlying capabilities. I think um, it's very hard for a new user to often get their head around rewriting history. And that's one of the most powerful things that you can do on a Git branch. I know that some organizations don't like that and it's, you never want to do it on a master branch, for example, but um, <laughs> don't make that mistake. Um, but exposing that to new users and helping them feel powerful and feel successful using Git, I think is a, is a really great thing because mm. it's not just about Git add, Git commit, Git push. Like there's, there's a whole lot more that you can be doing and having a local history and being able to just search it and interact with it freely is one of the big selling points of distributed version control and one of the reasons why it's been so successful. Yeah. I, I certainly enjoy the, enjoy the power of it, but I guess, uh, I, I guess back with combat, back with compatibility is the specter in the room because um, mm. you know all of the git commands that uh, people are very experienced with it yes. are familiar with uh, they don't want them to change suddenly under them so and uh, and, and it's 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 so flexible so i guess my um, the question that i least like to um, answer from uh, from somebody who's asking for help is is well what does git push without arguments do and it's kind of like well that depends doesn't it so i mean yeah is, is backwards compatibility and flexibility kind of, is, you know, does that mean that we should be, yeah, how, how, how do we solve that? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I just need a big hat that says it depends on it, right? Yeah. And every time I'm doing a training and any question, it's like, well, it just depends on like a bunch of things that you really don't care about. But that's hard. I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there are any easy solutions to that. I will say, actually, I think something in training as you know git enthusiasts it so has taken me time and i still struggle with no not telling them too much mm. um i can be so excited i can give them the long answer and i really want to um and knowing when that's just not right for them at that moment you know what do they need to hear to move their understanding along meaningfully mm. um and keeping my own excitement yeah. like tamped down enough to yeah. do that is um is hard maybe something people here can relate with and i think really important when you're helping yeah. new users with git it's interesting like I, I think i like we see quite a bit of uh uh like use case support cases where um i think like people that are not sort of git experts or gurus or even that interested in it uh end up doing like really complicated things or sophisticated things like, like rebasing and and, uh, and all these things when uh it's clear that they really understand what they're doing and uh and that, that can be a very dangerous thing. Yeah. And, and so, like, I wonder how that, how that happens. Like, as you said, like, I have to be careful not to overshare or, you know, like give them too much information right away. Um, I think that's really important, right? Like, you, you can be effective. And I think a lot of, like, sort of average or whatever like, engineers, developers that just use uh, these tools to get their work done, uh, they can get by very far without, you know, knowing how to rebase and how to reset and do all these these kind of things yes sometimes it's necessary yeah. but um i don't think it's necessary to immediately understand all of that kind of stuff and in fact it might be better to maybe not immediately you know jump on that and so i i feel that maybe sometimes new engineers sort of get get uh uh handed this 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 sheet of these are the things you need to do and you only need to rebase and you need to force push to I don't know what that is. Yeah. I'll just do it. Oh, it seems to work. Like that's a dangerous thing, and uh, that comes back in support cases because you know yeah. that, that blows up sometimes. Then you have yeah, no idea yeah. what to do. So, like again, I think there's a responsibility for for us. I mean, that's you're you're your trainer. Uh, you do <laughs> you do that stuff all the time, but um, for our products to uh, to uh, guide people towards you know like a sensible workflow, like that you know we know is a good place to start, yeah, and not overload them with all these like yeah. things that you know it could do. And sensible defaults so that yeah. if someone does try to force push to master, by default that's rejected because that is an objectively wrong thing to do most of the time. So we can protect our users from mistakes that are easy to make when copying and pasting from Stack Overflow. Cool. So um, I guess we'll probably have to kind of wrap up fairly, fairly rapidly. <laughs> Any kind of like... Um, uh, uh, last tips, guides, or stories you want to kind of like uh, uh, share with people for surviving Git in the enterprise? <laughs> surviving Git in the enterprise. 
that's a, that's a, that's a big one. Um, I guess if you're ever, I think in the enterprise, mm -hmm. there's um, an assumption that people may already know stuff that they don't know. Um, and it's, there's people maybe not ask questions, even though they have them. Um, so whenever you're interacting with someone, I, I my experience, just don't assume that they know something. You, know, you don't need to be insulting and talk mm -hmm. down to them, but it's also okay. I'm like the first person to say I don't know everything about Git, and I think enterprise users are no exception to that either. Yeah. I, don't know. I think there's the space to also encourage um, best practices, like um, not just with training, but also our tools can sort of like hint and nudge users and reward them for being successful in um, doing things that are really great like i know using long commit messages and things like that a lot of people forget that they're going to have to come back to those commit messages not just a week later but their colleague four years from now that they've never met is going to be reading those when there's a production outage um, and want to understand what was going on and so i think tools like gilab and bitbucket github we can reward users that do those right things and streamline those workflows and sort of I don't not gamify like that's that can be quite annoying, um, but just magnify the benefits of best practices so that even someone who just stumbles into GitLab or and does something well, like it just makes their life easier. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, um, James, Brianna, Eric. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this panel, and um, I'm sure we'll be able to kind of grab any of us after if you have any further questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Hey.